Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing My New Term, the revolutionary technology application connecting schools and candidates directly. Whether you're a school seeking to streamline your recruitment process or a candidate searching for your next role in education, My New Term has the solution. Developed by a former teacher, the technology at My New Term now connects tens of thousands of candidates with schools every month by digitizing the recruitment process. As a candidate, you can search for jobs, set up recommended jobs, and save time by applying directly to schools via a standardized online process. No more completing manual and repetitive application forms. Employers can streamline processes and save time utilizing the leading applicant tracking system for schools and multi-academy trusts. Recruitment in education has been broken for too long. My new term is on a mission to change just that. Visit MyNewTerm.com to learn more, search all the latest opportunities, or schedule a demo. My New Term, shaping the future of education recruitment. Hi everyone, it's Tom here from Teachers Talk Radio, just dropping by to tell you about our annual history teaching extravaganza, Teachers Talk History, which is coming at you live in Manchester on the 21st of September. The tickets are completely free for classroom teachers, amazing speakers, brilliant contributors, and a fantastic opportunity to network with fellow professionals. Grab your free ticket today at ttradio.org forward slash events and we will see you there. So good morning everyone and a very warm welcome to the Monday morning break. Um, Unfortunately it doesn't seem like the jingles are working so you're just going to have to excuse that for me this morning. Um, So what we will do is get straight on with the show um, and hopefully I'll be able to sort that and then uh, play you some jingles later on. but really glad this morning to be able to talk to Em um, about supporting deaf pupils in schools um, and in colleges, because I think this really essential aspect of fostering an inclusive educational environment. Um, as of 2023, approximately 50,000 children and young people in the UK are identified as deaf or having some level of hearing impairment and needs. Um, and this does necessitate tailored educational strategies to meet their needs effectively. Um, The importance of this support is highlighted during Deaf Awareness Week, which um, is back in May and is originally when I first spoke to Em. Uh, But I think although these weeks are fantastic for raising awareness about challenges and, and steps that can be taken, I do think with all these things, it's really important not to not to just stick to the week or um, the campaign, but to be talking about this year, year round. Um, But what this week, the Awareness Week does do is emphasise the critical role of education uh, in providing those equal opportunities. Um, It's a really good week for sharing uh, and spotlighting best practices um, and talk about the use of assistive technology um, and the importance of support staff. Um, But that is that is also things that we'll all talk about um, this morning with Em. So just really glad to have you on Em. Recent statistics um, indicate that only 44.8% of deaf pupils achieve grade four or above in both English and maths. And that is compared to 71.6% of hearing peers. Um, And this is a significant gap and it does underscore the necessity for improving um, support systems within educational settings. By addressing these disparities, schools and colleges can play a really pivotal role in enabling deaf students to achieve their full potential. Um, As we engage in this discussion, it's really crucial to consider the diverse needs of deaf pupils and the variety of resources that we have got. So, as I said, really glad to welcome Em. 
um, this morning. So I um, graduated um, from university with, with a BSc honours in Deaf Studies um, and teaches British Sign Language as well as um, in a previous role she actually arranged uh, classroom support for Deaf pupils. She also teaches Deaf Awareness in the workplace and in the community um, and teaching vulnerable learners introductory BSL. So real pleasure to have you on this morning. Um, and they think that it's easy and it's a skill that's just, you know, innate that you just can do. Um, but it's not easy and it's not entirely innate. It is to some extent, but you do have to go and learn it like a skill in, in class. Um, and there aren't enough lip reading classes across the country either, which is a real shame. <clears throat> so the reason I say it's partly innate is because as people get older and they start to lose their hearing, you'll find that your elderly grandparents' parents start to lip read without realising it. Yeah. And then there's some people, oh, Dad, you actually started to lip read me then. And people don't realise because it's just a way of surviving to be mm. able to understand other people. As they start to become deafened, they start to lip read you. So that's what I mean by it's partly innate, but it's also partly something that you learn that you have to go to classes for. So that's the first one. Yes, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it has made me think because you do, don't you, sort of automatically, especially if you're busy, you know, in a busy um, environment or there's lots going on or things like that. It is um, an automatic thing to look at, look at someone, isn't it, when they're talking and sort of decipher a bit, a bit more. So, yeah. OK, thank you. Really interesting. OK, so the next one, number two, is um, is sign language universal? So. A lot of people think that it's the same everywhere across the UK, across the world, and it's actually not. So last count, there are at least 70 different sign languages in use at the moment across the world. Um, and in each country, there are dialectal regional signs in use according to the part of the country, so east, south, west, etc. And in the UK, it's also not universal across from the bottom of Cornwall, the, the deep south, right up to the, the north of Scotland. So there are different regional signs in existence and in daily use across from the bottom of UK to the top. So a lot of people think that it is the same, but it's not. So that's my next one. That, yeah, I, that's <laughs> that's a really interesting one. I just I but I suppose it's you know it's the it's the same, isn't it? Same as language, it's you know colloquial, you know, colloquial. Um, but yeah, yeah, okay, that's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, and of course some sign languages are similar. So you've got um, Australian sign language. Um, there's very many similarities between that and British sign language, for example. So there are some similarities between some of the sign languages. The next one is Makaton and British Sign Language. A lot of people think that sign language is just Makaton um, and that they're both the same. But actually, that's a really big um, myth. They're not. They're very, very different. Um, and with that comes this kind of myth, myth, uh, misconception, if you like, um, about Makaton itself being a sign language in its own right. But it's not. It's a signed communication system that was developed um, a long time ago by a couple. And it was um, primarily um, to be developed and used with uh, children with disabilities, um, children with learning barriers as, a, as an added communication tool alongside other um, communication aids like visual aids, etc. Um, but it can't be called a sign language in its own right because it doesn't have a grammatical structure. And a language has to have that to be called a language. Whereas British Sign Language is a sign language in its own right. And we can call it that because it does have its own unique grammar like English. So that's where the biggest difference comes from. And there are a lot of signs that are used in Makaton that are borrowed from British Sign Language, but they're very, very different, both of those systems. That's so interesting. Yeah. OK, so complete. So completely different. Like you said, there's no grammatical structure to it. And it, it was, um, you know, it was devised in quite a different way, 
I guess then. Yeah. So it's it's you know a collection of signs like milk, eat, toilet, and things like that. But you can't construct a sentence in Makaton like you can in British Sign Language. And so you know again you, you can converse on a basic level um, with it's not just children, you know preschoolers, babies mm. can learn Makaton, and it's a really good sort of way to start signing in children. But it can't be replaced by British Sign Language. So when they reach kind of primary school age, deaf children. Children, hearing children, if they're going to learn sign language, should start learning BSL because right. that's the language of, of the deaf community. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, very interesting. And the last one, um, I hope that's okay to do four, yeah. Marie. I've yes, got um, the biggest, we've got really big one this is, and this is what the deaf community are always campaigning against, always fighting about, is um, basically that. People think that if, um, so parents of deaf children, so there are 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. So that's most deaf children. Um, only 5% are born to deaf parents who may use or may not use sign language. So the majority of deaf children that are born have hearing parents and will grow up in a speech led um, sort of home environment and learn to speak um, either with the help of speech and language therapists etc as well as um, learning with their parents and siblings but a lot of professionals particularly in those first few days at hospital the doctors consultants and paediatricians I'm sad to say will often say oh um, you know they need to learn to speak that you know this is what your deaf child needs to do but actually not often is there a conversation where the professionals say you know we recommend that your child starts to learn sign language as well as learning to speak and there's this common misconception that actually learning sign language as a deaf child growing up that that will hinder their acquisition of language of speech and that's a really massive misconception it's not just not true and there has been lots of research about this to prove that it's the opposite, that actually growing up, if you like, as a deaf child bilingual, learning both speech and sign language doesn't hinder, but actually empowers and enhances speech acquisition and is a massive, massively, you know, positive thing for parents to encourage their children to do. So that could be that could be really quite damaging, couldn't it? That misconception. Yeah, um, and then it has been. Yeah. And, it, and it has, you know, and, and there's been lots of programs, lots of um, sort of, um, you know, sort of, uh, what was I going to say, kind of public, you know, awareness about this in recent years, because there's been programs on the television about, um, you know, celebrities that have, you know, actually regretted their decision to not allow their child to become involved in the deaf community to learn BSL when they were younger. Um, and feel quite regretful about that because, you know, as teenagers, as young adults, when they do discover that other world and that sign language and how beautiful and how accessible it is to be able to converse with other deaf sign language users, um, you know, is a, is a beautiful thing. Um, so, yeah, I think it's extremely important. For, for parents to consider that and to go and join organisations such as the National Deaf Children's Society for advice, and they will encourage parents to learn sign language and to allow their child to access the language as well. Yeah, oh, really important, really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, thank you for thank you for that. I mean, it is um, it is really important, isn't it? And that's why it's so it's so nice to have you on, and it's so important to have you on here to to talk about these kind of myths and misconceptions, and and um, you know raise awareness, like you said, just really to kind of um, support people and support children. Um, that I I didn't know that either. That that ninety five percent of um, of deaf children are are born to hearing parents. You know that's that's significant, isn't it? Um, Oh, yeah so thank you for all of those um so the next thing that i wanted to to ask you about um is is the is the bsl act um yeah. and and what what that means and and what are the obligations about that so yes i mean it took a long time to um you know 
have that legislation come into in, come into place and for the government to recognise British Sign Language in its own right as a language of the British deaf community. Um, they've been campaigning for years and years and years to, to obtain that recognition of their language and their, and their culture. So it was a real um, you know, turning point for the deaf community in 2022. And what that act means is that now there is a panel of deaf professional people that are advising and meeting with the government um, to actually look at how we can improve access to services for deaf sign language users across the UK, but particularly um, in public services. So those mainstream services that everybody else can access with ease, whereas sign language users often struggle and, and come against um, barriers to communication because a lot of these services, you know, the staff, the representatives don't have knowledge of BSL, don't have knowledge of you know the, the the different community different culture of the deaf community so i think that's the main focus is to kind of create more accessibility more inclusion for deaf bsl users um across the workplace not just as employees themselves and to obviously um create awareness and um encourage employers to employ more deaf people rather than it being a bit of a sticking point that when uh, a deaf uh, potential employee puts on their application form, oh, I'm deaf, you know, a lot of employers think, oh, oh gosh, that's going to cost me lots of money in accommodations and everything. That's a misconception again, because it doesn't. And there's things like the access to work scheme, which, you know, encourages and supports deaf people financially to, um, you know, be able to access, you know, uh, equipment and, and interpreters or um, support workers to support them in the workplace. So it's not actually um, a massive hurdle for employers to employ deaf people. Um, so it's about thinking about those things. It's about encouraging more um, teacher training, funding for that so that more deaf people can teach sign language as well, because there's a lack of deaf tutors across the UK um, and much more demand for learning sign language and not enough teachers to accommodate that need. So there's that as well. And um, so, you know, campaigning with the government to, you know, look at ways of um, increasing funding for that. Um, but it's also about the hurdles that they've overcome already with the Act. So, for example, one of the biggest ones at the moment is that within the next few years, but they say 2025, that they're going to introduce the um, British Sign Language GCSE in secondary schools as an option for sixth formers to choose alongside any of their other uh, options. And I think that's going to be a massive um, change in terms of more and more hearing um, young people are going to be choosing that option to learn sign language, which means our future generations, there's going to be a lot more people knowing how to sign. And that will be a massive thing for the sign language community and the deaf community at large. So I think there's lots of good, positive things about the Act that are coming. Um, you know, it does, it does sit hand in hand with the obligations of the Equality Act in terms of, you know, we do need to be, as a country, as, as, as a kind of a you know, a nation, we need to be more aware of this section, if, this, if you like, this subculture in our community of the deaf community. And there are thriving deaf communities across the whole of the country in the UK. And there's lots and lots of sign language users and their families and their siblings and their partners, etc., interpreters, etc., that use this language. And we need to encourage more and more people to be able to also embrace the language and also embrace deaf awareness and what that actually means in practice. Yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. Um, so did you say it was it 2022? So there wasn't there wasn't the, the the act only came in a couple of years ago. It did. Um, but you know, as I said, you know, the deaf community have been campaigning for this really official recognition of their language as a language in its own right, alongside English, Scottish, and Welsh, etc. Um, long before that. So, you oh. know, in 1985 was the last time that they, they gained any sort of um, recognition towards that. And that wasn't full recognition because it didn't, you know, get to the kind of act legislation stage back then. But prior to that, they'd been campaigning for many, many years before that to say, look, this is our language. This is our main language. Why shouldn't we have our language recognised? We don't feel that you know, we're an important part 
of the community and you know that's that was really well it's, it's really quite shocking isn't it that it's taken it that is. long that's what I'm thinking. It is absolutely shocking and I mean discriminatory, really. And I was absolutely. just thinking it must it must be it must be incredibly isolating as well. Yeah. I mean that's the yeah. thing, isn't it? And it you is. know, like you said, it's 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 it is it's their language. It's a language, um, the same as others. And I I agree with you. I think the fact that that is coming in as a qualification, um, I think there would there would be a lot a lot of interest in learning it, um, you know, for for everyone, um, because then it's you know it's another just another way of of inclusivity, isn't it? And yes. and it and it is already. I mean, there's been a, a massive surge in in people wanting to learn the language um, because of social media, because of what's been happening of late in terms of you know uh, Rose uh, Ailing Ellis, yeah. you know, the deaf dancer on Strictly Come Dancing. She really put it out there in terms of, you know, what what a deaf person's needs are in terms of, you know, being a contestant on a major mainstream program like that, you know, about having an interpreter there. You know, before that, did you see that on television? Did you see that in the forefront of a program's making and, and screening and recording of something? No, you know, oh. so that really put it on the map in terms of, you know, this is a deaf sign language user. This is what she needed to be able to, you know, function as a dancer in the same way as all the other hearing dancers on the program so I think it really highlighted you know how inclusive you need to be and how easy it is to make those um accommodations you know and, and that's it yeah, I, I think that's it, isn't it? Is that's a, that's a, a, a very similar message to a lot of things I think around inclusivity and and things like that. And you know, you mentioned it as well. You know, if somebody is applying for a job, for example, um, and in, you know, employers possibly would, like you said, go, oh my good, goodness, um, you know, and it's going to cost me loads of money, and are they going to be able to do the job, and and so on, which again, it, it is discriminatory. Um, and you mentioned as well the access to work work scheme which I'm always surprised that not uh, not as many people seem to know about it um, yes. it's fantastic um, and and like you said it's it's there to support people who'd be you know incredibly valuable um yeah, I mean, of, of workplace you know yeah, um, and, I, and I think that's it that's it sorry to interrupt you but the message is that you know a deaf person a deaf potential employee of your company organization can do everything that a hearing person a hearing employee can do they just can't hear so yeah. you know there might be a minor accommodation like they may not be able to use the phone as in speak on the phone but they can do everything else they can email they can do you know they can meet with people in person on teams and all the rest of it on, on zoom but they just can't answer the phone that's one tiny thing and and you know is that a big expense to an employer no no you know? and and no. often some deaf people are some of the most hard working most uh you know sort of really get go really sort of um raring to go you know wanting to do their best because they're not often given the same op opportunities mm -hmm. that everyone, than, than everyone else so they really are loyal they really are um fantastic employees it's just yes. being given the chance to still actually prove that they can do that and they and prove prove themselves you know and that's that's the fight they have every day looking for an employment looking for a job yeah yeah and, and and like you know like we keep saying that's about just why it's so important isn't it to to talk about these misconceptions talk about these myths to raise awareness um and yeah ab absolutely um totally totally can see that um okay so if we um, move on a little bit and i'd just like to really hear more about sort of Deaf aware practices. I mean, that's something that's something that we've we've sort of mentioned um, in preparing for for this. Um, and so we just really would like to hear some more about that, if that's okay. So yeah, absolutely. So deaf awareness, um, contrary again to popular belief, is not just about being perhaps aware someone might have a hearing loss, might be deaf, might be hard of hearing, um, because we can see hearing aids or any other visual um, assistive technology, because Often people um, may not have hearing aids, may not have cochlear implants and are profoundly deaf or could be across the spectrum of mildly deaf, moderately deaf, severely deaf, etc. So we don't always know visually that someone is. So it's not just about that. It's about being aware of 
their environment, being aware of the things that we can do easily to make communication easier with that deaf person, particularly if we think or suspect that they might be lip reading us. So when I say looking at our environment, you know, it's not just about, um, you know, people being able to lip read us um, easily. Lip reading is challenging. It's not easy to do. And certain things are distracting to lip readers. For example, um, visual distractions, lots of people passing by when you're sitting with them having a chat. You know, sometimes they might want to go somewhere a bit quieter where there's less background noise because hearing aids amplify all sounds. So the background noise we ignore, you know, is really loud, a cacophony of noise to people with assistive aids. And um, so we might need to say to them, you know, would you like to go to a quieter space where we can hear each other better? Um, or you can lip read me without lots of distractions. Um, you know, background noise comes in, you know, background machinery and offices whirring, you know, central heating in the winter ticking, um, printers, photocopiers burring, you know, even a computer makes a noise that, you know, we just ignore, but could be loud to them. So in offices, it might be going to a different space, a different room that is, is quieter. Um, looking at where we've got in the summer, open windows with traffic noise passing by, footfall outside can be noisy, or just simply sharing an open plan office with other office workers, other employees, other colleagues that might be moving furniture on hard floors when they get up or speaking loudly on a conversation on Zoom or whatever or on the telephone, you know, that sort of thing is all a cacophony of noise to deaf people. So, you know, thinking about our environment, the lighting, making sure they can see us to lip read our, our lips and our, look at our faces, making sure that, you know, we can be seen easily and the lighting is good. Um, also, you know, it's very, very important to make sure you stand or sit, you know, in one place and, and stay still, because, you know, if you turn your head away, people can't lip read the bottom of your, you know, the top of your head or the back of your back. You know, and that's a real bugbear for me with teaching as well, mentoring teachers, they always do that. So try and stand or sit still facing them. And that's not rocket science, is it? But so yeah. many people, these really easy, fundamental things. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Introducing My New Term, the revolutionary technology application connecting schools and candidates directly. Whether you're a school seeking to streamline your recruitment process or a candidate searching for your next role in education, My New Term has the solution. Developed by a former teacher, the technology at My New Term now connects tens of thousands of candidates with schools every month by digitizing the recruitment process. As a candidate, you can search for jobs, set up recommended jobs, and save time by applying directly to schools via a standardized online process. No more completing manual and repetitive application forms. Employers can streamline processes and save time utilizing the leading applicant tracking system for schools and multi-academy trusts. Recruitment in education has been broken for too long. My new term is on a mission to change just that. Visit MyNewTerm.com to learn more, search all the latest opportunities, or schedule a demo. My New Term, shaping the future of education recruitment. Hi everyone, it's Tom here from Teachers Talk Radio, just dropping by to tell you about our annual history teaching extravaganza, Teachers Talk History, which is coming at you live in Manchester on the 21st of September. The tickets are completely free for classroom teachers, amazing speakers, brilliant contributors, and a fantastic opportunity to network with fellow professionals. Grab your free ticket today at ttradio.org forward slash events and we will see you there. You know, people think, oh, it's okay to chew gum, you know, but lip readers can't read because when you chew gum, your mouth patterns are, are actually, um, what's the word, made 
it, what's the word? I can't think of it. I can't think of words today, Marie. <laughs> you know, when distorted, that's it. Not quite right. Not the same. You know, same as, you know, eating. Just, you know, don't do those things. Don't cover your mouth with your hand unless you're going to cough, you know, um, mm. because they can't lip read your lips behind your hand. Um, so I think it's things like that. They're kind of my top deaf awareness tips, if you like, is just trying to be thinking about what's around you, thinking about making it as easy as possible to communicate with that person. Yeah, I was just thinking, that it, you know, that's exactly the word that sprung to my mind. It's a bit thoughtful, isn't it? Just being, just thinking about um, the things that maybe are, you know, mo- I know, moving and like moving your head and uh, walking and, and all of those kind of things are, are things that sometimes people naturally do, don't they? Um, so it's just probably, it is just sort of stopping and, and thinking about about making it easier for the other person yeah. that's what you said and another big thing that people do in, the, in and really they do it with in the, with the best intentions but and this has happened to me with deaf friends of mine is that you know hearing people think when they meet a deaf person you know they don't know what level of deafness they've got they don't know how much they lip read because you don't know them so people will automatically go into this mode of talking really like this and over enunciating what they say so hello Marie how are you I mean it's just ridiculous it's just offensive and stupid and makes the deaf person really cross because yeah. one they can't lip read you because your, your lips are really over enunciated and unnatural and two people speak too loudly too fast and then it's impossible to lip read someone um yeah. and and they're not stupid you don't need to speak to them like that they're not you know Yes, that's yeah. It must that must actually be quite offensive because it's you know it's in in you know treating somebody um uh, yeah in the way that you don't need to be treated like you said if you're just talking normally then that's how somebody can yeah I mean we I mean I'm laughing I don't mean to laugh I'm not laughing sort of you know at deaf people of course but it's kind of I'm laughing because it's so ridiculous that you know us hearing people think it's okay to do that because we think we're helping we're supporting we're making it easier in fact we're doing the opposite that's the irony yes yes <laughs> yeah um but like you said you know I'm sure sometimes it is with the best intentions but then that's why we need to be is why we need to educate ourselves isn't it um yeah because you don't want to accidentally offend somebody or annoy them um yeah um so I know you know one of the things that you've done in the past was um and this is really of interest to me was um arranging classroom support for deaf pupils um so i know you've given some excellent tips there on sort of deaf aware practices um and and thinking about sort of how you're talking and presenting and communicating but what what are the things that we could do to make sort of teaching and our classrooms more accessible and inclusive to to deaf pupils OK, so, yeah, I mean, there's so much um, obviously in the in the space of today, we don't have that time to really spend. But this could be a topic all of its own, Marie. Um, and I must point, you know, your listeners towards a really brilliant resource that I've gone back to over the years so many times when I've mentored um, new trainee, you know, trained teachers into further education, for example. And it's called Deaf Friendly Teaching. And it's a PDF that you can get from the National Deaf Children's Society, um, particularly if you become a member to their sort of um, newsletters, etc. cetera. Um, I really recommend this document. It's quite long, but it, it's real go-to um, of uh, tips and, and, and information and uh, advice and guidance for teachers. Um, who are differentiating resources for deaf learners in the classroom, whether it's primary right up to, you know, uh, um, university sort of level lecturers. It it really doesn't matter. The principles are the same. So I've got a few things that I've kind of picked out that I think are really key. So it's about, you know, using lots of visual aids with deaf learners because they are visual learners. Um, And also thinking about the acoustics in your classroom. And that's difficult because if you're in a school or a college or a a teaching environment that's an older building, that's obviously difficult. You can't change those things. But there are lots of things you can do to improve acoustics of a room. Um, And and those things are having soft um, furnishings, if you can, and having um, a soft 
carpet carpeted floor, which you know bounces the sound off, um, and also things like just posters on the wall and things like that can actually improve acoustics. But these are my my main ones I thought of. So deaf learners may want to sit at the front so that they can see the teacher, read your lips, and see what's being said. But you need to ensure that they sit where they're comfortable. So you need to ask the deaf learner themselves, where would you like to sit um, and in the first lesson? And, and always make sure that their, their seat is there, wherever they choose. If they've got note takers, manual or electronic note takers or interpreters, if they're BSL users, you know, again, ask the learner where those support, you know, um, staff would like to sit with them would they like them to sit opposite them to the side next to the teacher in front of them you know ask the learner don't assume and don't ask the professionals because at the end of the day they're there to support the deaf learner so they would always ask the learner as well a big one is if you've got a deaf person deaf learner sitting at the front of your class and you're doing q and a's always make sure that you repeat the contributions, questions, comments, contributions of other learners behind that deaf learner all the time, because they will miss a lot of that because they're sitting at the front and they can't be constantly craning the net looking around and they'll often miss who was speaking and, and won't be able to lip read them behind them. So that's a really, really important one. And it seems odd, you know, teachers say to me, oh, but I feel odd. And it takes, you know, valuable time of my lesson repeating things. But actually, that's all about accessibility, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And including that deaf learner. So we must do that. Always provide subtitling, uh, subtitles on resources or at worst case, if you haven't got that and you really need to show a certain clip or video, and you haven't got that, and you haven't got to, you know, and you for some reason you've not been able to get that, then worst case, you should provide a simple synopsis summary before the lesson of what's in that video clip for the deaf learner to look through and familiarise themselves with what it's going to be about. Another one, which is a really common error of lots of teachers, is that Teachers like to wander about the class. They like to walk to the back of the class while they're making a point. You know, um, then they'll wander around the back and through the chairs and come to the front again. Then they'll turn to the whiteboard or, or whatever it is, or the flip chart, and they'll be talking, looking at that. No good. You are a moving target then. And a deaf person that lip reads can't read your lips when you're moving. You need to stand still stand facing the class at the front and stay there and be confident that that's the best thing to do. Radio aids. A lot of learners do use radio aids um, where the teacher wears the microphone so they can pick up their voice through their um, hearing aids. <coughs> you may have seen or the listeners might have known about a famous very tall comedian who used to be a teacher who has got this very sort of famous story about what happened to him when he was a teacher and he had a deaf learner and he had a radio aid and he was wearing the microphone and he forgot to turn it off oh. and he went off to the toilet and oh. yes the poor deaf learner heard everything oh in the God. toilet and when he returned to the room it was very embarrassing for him and the learner so always turn them off before you leave the room because oh, it's not horrendous. just things yeah I know it's not just things like that it's about you know all of us as professionals, there are times when we need to have private conversations away yeah. from the prying eyes, if it's mm -hmm. a BSL user, and ears of our hearing and deaf learners, etc. So again, if you've got your microphone on, those conversations can be heard by the person who's using the radio aid. So you need to be aware of that, about confidentiality. Give time for the deaf learners to answer. So if you ask them a question, don't just give up after a few seconds if they're not answering straight away. They need time to process and understand what you're asking. So always give them time to answer you. If you've got lots of tasks, break them down into manageable, easy chunks for them to digest and to understand what is expected of them. And that's even more key if they've got a support worker next to them, a note taker or, or, or a, a, a communication support worker who signs um, 
to aid uh, communication, you need to allow time for the communication support worker or the interpreter to explain to the deaf learner what's expected, what the task um, encompasses and what they're supposed to be doing um, and what the aims are as well. So they understand why they're doing something. And often it's not about just saying this is the task and the same with any learner. They need to understand why you're doing it and what the expectation is and what the aim is. Why? What's it going to do? What does it mean for them? So make it meaningful. And the last thing is about English itself. So when you're writing maybe on a whiteboard or a flip chart, some bullet points about key bits of information, don't write in longhand and just write key words. And particularly this is important if you've got a deaf learner with a note taker there who's taking every note of everything you say, everything you teach and contribute, as well as the learners around the deaf learner they're supporting, that you make sure that you explain things. So if you've got a word like a jargon word that's being used in a certain kind of class subject, you know, a deaf learner often may not understand or have come across that piece of jargon. So you need to break that down as the teacher. Well, this means this, you know, and give examples of these things so that it becomes real to them. They understand it and can situate it in real life, if you like. Um, so, yeah, they're my top tips in the classroom. Yeah, they're brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, there's quite a lot there, wasn't there, in terms of sort of environmental. Um, so I, I think was it, you know, thinking about the acoustics and um, put posters on the wall and anything and, and carpet and, and anything furnishing just to kind of manage those acoustics. Like you said, sometimes, you know, in, in schools, it, it could be they could be older buildings, could be quite echoey and things like that. So I think that was really interesting. That was a really good tip. Um, and then the, the other things, wasn't it, as it was sort of, you know, as I was listening to you is um, about the seating, um, you know, and the support and 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 things like that but I think what what I really liked what you said is you know don't assume I think that's so key isn't it and ask the ask the learner don't ask the support worker or the professional but ask the learner and that's about respect isn't it you know and um, and just not assuming what, some, what somebody needs um mm. and the other thing that I really liked as well it was you so when you were saying you know if you're doing um if there are contributions from other pupils and they're put, potentially behind um repeating back um but what struck me about that you know is um this is all this is uh, the same as many things isn't it this is going to benefit everyone um it's not you know it's not necessarily just about making accommodations for one deaf pupil but these kind of practices um and explaining jargon that's another one as well you know they, oh. they probably won't be the only one in the class that doesn't know absolutely that. Um, absolutely so and, and learners things... that and learners like neurodiverse learners you know yes learners that are on the spectrum you know or, or can't sit still because they've got adhd or, or you know their attention deficit you know the, the attention is really short things like that you know the it really teachers navigate a really difficult um route now kind of experience every day in the classroom and it becomes more challenging for teachers to kind of differentiate and make sure every learner is important and is accessing the class and is being motivated, empowered, etc. But as you say, it's not just about the deaf learner. They're very important because, um, you know, deafness is an invisible sensory loss. So you can't always visually see, oh, yeah, that person, um, you can see their fidgeting or that person is losing interest or losing their mm. attention. or You're just losing them full stop. And we all know about that horror that teachers experience of, oh, I've lost that learner or I'm losing them and then yeah. trying to bring them back. It's about so many other learners in the class that these things, these strategies are relevant for as well. You're right. Yeah, yeah, really. And, and not difficult to do I think that's what's coming through isn't it from all of this everything that you're talking about it's not hard to do but it's no. it's 
it's having the thought to do it and it's having the awareness um, yeah. of why you're doing it as well. Um, so, yeah. yeah, no, I thought those those tips were, were really interesting. And it, what was the resource as well? So I think just come back to that because you said it was a PDF and it's from the National Deaf. Yeah, deaf, deaf. I mean, this is it's quite old. <laughs> so I hope you can still get it. But it was from the National Deaf Children's Society and it's called Deaf Friendly Teaching. And it's a PDF and the PDF comes as deaf underscore friendly underscore teaching so you know I hope that people can get hold of that um I'll yeah. try and contact them as well just a deaf learner um in uh at university and they wanted to or they needed to have a, a, a note taker uh, an electronic note taker to take notes for them in their lectures and uh they asked if the note taker could always sit separately from them um and you know, provide their notes on sort of a sharing platform like OneDrive after the lecture. And um, so they had a regular note taker, luckily, although that doesn't always happen in HE. Sometimes they have rotors in support where different note takers will go around to support different learners. But this this uh, young lad did have a regular note taker who really got to know him and they got to know each other. Anyway, that all went well. And then one day, this particular note taker, favoured note taker, was not well, so was off sick. And uh, she organised a replacement note taker on that day before she left or before uh, you know, she, she left for the day to say she wouldn't be in the next day. But unfortunately, and we don't really know exactly what happened here, but it might have been the support office didn't actually follow on and check with the new replacement note taker about what their responsibilities were or whether it was just the note taker didn't check. You know, it was you know one or the other. But when the new note taker went into the session with the learner, she hadn't uh, had a look into what his support package was. And so she went and sat with him next to him and yeah and of course all his peers then saw that he had this uh, note taker support worker with him and he got ribbed like they do mm. um which is unusual isn't it but yeah obviously not his friends um and he was mortified this deaf yeah. learner really affected him he was really upset he felt really let down and he mm -hmm. complained so it, but easily that situation could have been avoided, couldn't it? Yes. By better yes. communication between yeah. the new note taker and the support office, looking at his support package, making sure that they knew what they needed to do, what they shouldn't do before yeah. they entered the lecture room. And then that all could have been avoided. Yeah. And it's that thing, isn't it? I think, you know, that you've talked about already about not assuming, not assuming and and just treating people with respect, because that must yeah. have just been so mortifying yeah. for him, obviously, and really impacted him. Um, and like you said, you know, two minutes to just find out that he didn't want someone sat next to him. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. So that's that's kind of a, a, a more, you know, um, not so good story. But then to finish, I thought, let's have a more positive one. So um, for many years, I supported myself um, when I was working in further education as a specialist support coordinator for deaf learners across all the campuses, as well as teaching PSL. I um, mentored and supported a deaf young lady and she had had a very checkered life of uh, you know, quite sad and difficult experiences through her education, both at school and at college, before the college she was at with me. And she really had lost a lot of confidence in herself as a deaf person. She was a signer, but also spoke. So spoke English as well as was a signer. And she was really quite um, timid and lacked confidence when I met her. Anyway, over the years, we did one to one support, you know, assignment support, things like that. And I also then got the chance to support her in class as a communication support worker, signing for her, translating what the lecturer was saying, etc. And she she decided to do a course called Forensic Science B-Tech. And um, yeah, she struggled through it. It was, you know, it was quite scientific. It was quite hard concepts you know, for her to understand. And goodness me, it was a real challenge for me to sign and translate some of the concepts. And we had a laugh along the way over the, you know, year or so of the course. And we, you know, and we just, 
we got through it and we and we did it together and she ended up passing with a distinction star and she was so proud because she'd got so far and you know from that that gave her the boost to go on after college after she worked at college for a bit as an employee in the science lab and you know sadly that ended because she was a an apprentice that ended after a year and she was she had to leave because there was no more funding so she left and then she thought no I can do this so she then contacted me and said I'm going to go to university and I just was my heart soared because I knew that this was a massive thing for her so she went to um University of the West of England and did criminology and she had three years where you know, tears, laughter, you know, you name it, as every undergrad can experience, not just a deaf undergrad, but she really struggled with her essays, you know, her English being a second language, she was not, she didn't find it hard, easy at all, but she got through, we did a lot of support together as well, and eventually, not me, but her, she got through with a 2-1, and she even got an award for diversity and equity and, and diversity in the university a special award that she got on her graduation day and she knew nothing about it and she had a hearing dog as well so she was walking up the aisle with her hearing dog you know to go and receive her degree her scroll and uh, everyone was sort of clapping as she walked up and then they were sort of I know we're listening but you know all the sort of people were clapping looking at her and then looked down as they clapped at this dog as though oh Oh, there's a hearing assistance dog there as well so there was extra claps because they realized that she was somebody with you know these extra barriers if you like and uh, she got her award and she was so thrilled because she hadn't expected that um and she overcame so much to get to there so it's a real tribute to her really and her strength of character that she overcame so much um you know to achieve what she did that is such a lovely, lovely story. And um, I'm thank you so much for sharing that. And that just, um, yeah, I think that just sums it up, doesn't it? That, that with support um, and determination um, that, that she showed um, and, the, and the right kind of support um, and awareness um, from everyone involved um, that, you know the sky's the limit she did it and a 2-1 as well it's just absolutely incredible achievement um and yeah and that's a lovely lovely story and I think really representative of why we all need to be getting it right um you know so that she had an amazing te you know teaching team that were there that you know we we sort of worked with the whole you know three years making sure that they knew how to differentiate for her, making sure they knew how to work with interpreters, because she had interpreters and note takers the whole way through, um, making sure that the support office knew what her needs were right from the start. Um, you know, and there were problems and there were misconceptions. There were there was ignorance. There was people saying and assuming what she needed rather than asking her that same old mm. adage, assuming rather than you know, actually asking her directly, you know, what do you need? What do you want? Um, what will make things easier for you? You know, um, but yeah, I think I think it, it is amazing. And there there are that just is testament to the to the fact that, you know, deaf people can achieve anything they want to. We just need to give them the right tools. We need to have the right tool set to do that right from the start, right from early education through and there's no reason why we can't do that but it is hard because deafness is an invisible sensory loss and it's so it's not visual it's often they're forgotten they're like the forgotten person people in the class because people don't visually have that visual kind of reminder you know like they would other learning barriers that they're there and they're often they don't speak up and they don't shout what about me because they're so used to being oppressed, they're so used to be being forgotten. All well, I think, yeah, I think that's just such a key, important message to kind of sum up the show, really, um, and everything that you've spoken about today is. Um, and so, yeah, that that would be that would be what I would want listeners to take away from this: is don't don't forget about your deaf pupils. Um, educate yourself on on resources and support, and don't assume what they need, ask them what they need. Um, and let's all kind of work and, and, and be inclusive 
um, together. So thank you so very, very much for coming on and talking about it. And I feel like I've learned a lot. I, I don't think I knew enough. Um, so I'm definitely going to go and look up some of those resources and get on the mailing list for the National Deaf Children's Society. Um, and yeah, I would just encourage, um, you know, anyone that's been listening and, and wants to ask more to, to get, get in touch with, with us. And I'm, I'm sure you'd be happy to carry on conversations. Em. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It'd be wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming on and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. You've thank been you. listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.